to Boris and Tom talk of uh, Hart Boeing. Uh, Hart is a, a media theorist and a critic. Uh, today, uh, he, he, he's going to present about his latest work of the uh, Institute of Network Cultures. Uh, actually, he's here uh, for the Amber Fest conference, and uh, tomorrow he's going to talk at Afghanistan at 11.30. Uh, he's going to continue talking about the tactical media as well as the social media. Uh, so we're also uh, hosting the Amber Fest uh, conference on Sunday at South Kola, the South Kola, so we would uh, ask you to join us. Uh, in all of the conferences. So thank you for coming and thanks Hart. Right. Hello. Um yeah, wait, I it has to be switched on, otherwise you don't hear me. Yep. Thanks. Okay. All right. Welcome everyone. Uh, great that you all turned up. I'm very happy. Uh, I felt a bit uh, silly. I said, well, this is my first visit to Turkey, my first visit to Istanbul. So I said, well, it's such a pity if uh, I don't have the opportunity to uh, also present my, my work here uh, to you. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, of course, it's going to be you know, hardcore politics, it's going to be, uh, we're going to talk about Gezi Park, we're going to talk about the role of social media, we're going to talk about uh, tactical media and uh, the current state of, uh, of affairs uh, in, in a hopeful, uh, lively uh, discussion. So that is going to be very uh, different in a way. But um, tonight I uh, want to use this opportunity to uh, present uh, the work uh, of my institute, uh, Institute of Network Cultures, founded almost 10 years ago uh, in Amsterdam. It is based in the Hoogschool van Amsterdam, which is a polytechnic uh, a University of Applied Science. Uh, I used to work at the University of Amsterdam Media Studies as well, but um, I quit there and now I'm here in this place full time and I'm very happy about that. Um, a, let's, let me just see if I'll go there. Oh. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, before I will go and speak about uh, a very specific topic, namely um, social media monopolies and um, there are alternatives. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the social media question, uh, if there is one, at least for me there is. Um, uh, I would like to tell a little bit more about uh, our methodology and uh, the different uh, projects, uh, maybe also as, as an invitation for you if you are interested uh, in one of them to, to join. Uh, one of these uh, networks. Right. Um, <coughs> the main one, uh, and then the most m probably most well-known one, uh, is this network called the Video Vortex, uh, founded in uh, late 2006, just a year after uh, YouTube uh, kicked off. Now, YouTube was rather late, uh, so the video phenomena has been around for, for a while, already in the, in the 90s, uh, we had the real network and uh, several other uh, attempts like uh, QuickTime films and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, the invention of the, um, uh, the monitor, the, the um, uh, in-browser, um, as you can see it here, um, screen um, made a whole uh, big difference and uh, caused the breakthrough of, uh, of YouTube. YouTube was then bought up by Google, as you know, and the rest uh, is um, history. Uh, so we, for us, this was kind of uh, a thing that was bound to happen. So a lot of people who were working with video already at the time uh, got together 
um, and it, it's uh, still an existing, uh, very lively network. Um, this is the last Video Vortex event that we organized, that you look at here, number nine, uh, which was held in uh, March for the first time in, uh, in Germany, in Lüneburg, uh, just south of, uh, of Hamburg. Um, so this network, there's about four or five hundred people who are part of it. A lot of them are video activists, artists. Uh, some, there's, a, there's a technical part of it. Uh, Andres Tresco was uh, here, uh, was in Izmir. Uh, he was one of the organizers of the Video Vortex number no. three, which was uh, held in uh, Ankara. Um, so it, it w ha was already happening here in Turkey at some point. Um, and yeah, now uh, this weekend we also hope to uh, talk here with a lot of uh, you guys out here to see if maybe Video Vortex number 10 can happen here in Istanbul. Uh, so uh, this is really, uh, we would really love that uh, to happen. So uh, let's see uh, if, uh, if this is uh, uh, gonna, gonna happen, probably somewhere next, uh, next year. So um, yeah, Video Vortex is, uh, is emphasizing, as I said, on, on different uh, aspects, bringing together in a kind of next five minutes tactical media spirit of the 90s, bringing together a lot of artists, activists and programmers. Yeah? So, so what we see is we, we think in, in a kind of a, in a, in a unity of, uh, of technical questions, political questions and aesthetics. And we think that these three elements, they are uh, closely connected and uh, the, uh, and uh, in all the networks that we build up, we try to bring together uh, these uh, three things. So we're not primarily only focusing on, let's say, visual arts, not only on the technological side. Uh, think of HTML5, uh, think of the use of uh, video in, in websites like Wikipedia. And, uh, the online video is, of course, on the march. Uh, you can see it everywhere. Um, uh, but um, uh, also, of course, and I want to mention that here explicitly, of course, uh, if you think of Getty Park, uh, there's a very strong element uh, as well uh, of uh, video activism. Uh, and uh, so th that there are many, many urgent issues that people want to wanna discuss. Um, and uh, so that is happening in this framework. We produced two readers, you can download them. Uh, and and a, a couple of uh, uh, publications, uh, smaller ones, and they're all about the theory of online video. You know, what makes online video different from film and television? That is the key question uh, that we uh, address. What does it mean that we live in the age of the database? Uh, what, do, what does it mean for the users and for the producers uh, that we produce for the database? Uh? In the past, filmmakers used to think that they were producing for uh, the cinema, huh? for the space. These days, huh? that's different. We, we are acutely aware that we produce for the database. YouTube is the biggest database. By the way, YouTube uh, is also the second biggest search engine. Huh? Don't forget that. The second big, biggest en search engine in the world is not Yahoo, uh, is not Bing, uh, but it's YouTube. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so we d d this requires a whole new kind of uh, mindset uh, of uh, what uh, video makers uh, are uh, doing. Okay, uh, th another big project for us, uh, as I already said, we are producing readers, we are producing uh, books, physical books that you, uh, in fact, at the moment are still uh, free. So you can, if you send me an email with your postal address, you'll get the book. Uh, in fact, you'll get them in the mail uh, for free. Uh, don't ask me why, but that's the, the weird thing about the internet economy uh, as it is right now. Uh, we are living under the dictatorship of, uh, of the free, uh, in, in a way. Um, and uh, so the, the, ho the whole question of, uh, you know, how um, publications should be produced is a really important one. It's an important one 
for, for those who work in libraries, in bookstores, but also for people who work in education. Uh, what is the future of the book? How, how are we going to uh, make publications uh, together? Uh, and this project uh, uh, here is co still called the Unbound Book, uh, but uh, in fact, at the moment, we got money for two years, uh, and now it's called the Hybrid, uh, sorry, Digital Publishing Toolkit. Um, also with, uh, with Lüneburg and uh, with, uh, with Rotterdam, we, we were doing this. Uh, it's all also, again, about the role of aesthetics. It's about the role of designers. Now, what is the role of, the, of a designer when we're, when we're talking about EPUB? Uh, do you already know, you know how much uh, limitations there are uh, in, in the EPUB format and what the politics are at the moment? Uh, think about the struggles th between the giants, the, the titanic struggles that are going on there between Kindle, Amazon, between um, Google on the other hand, between uh, the big publishers. Uh, so th uh, we think that there is an important role for us to play, us here, uh, in, a, in a very broad sense, uh, and that we have to get involved. We have to... Uh, you know, say, well, we don't like this. We don't like this uh, or that proprietary format. We, uh, we want books to look like, like this or that. We want books where we can make comments. We want books uh, where we can also look at, uh, at video and so on and so on. Open standards, if possible, right? So the politics uh, there uh, are really strong. And the role of designers, of book designers, is now changing, of course. Uh, book designers are incredibly limited these days. Of course, you could say, well, in the past, they were limited by print. Uh, and book designers were limited by the fact that the, that the footnotes had to go here and not there, and, and that the, the book was looking like this and not the other way. Well, these days, there are new limitations. Uh, but maybe there are also new possibilities. And this program is about... Um, finding out together what the new pub, uh, possibilities are. Uh, so if you want to join uh, uh, the, all, the, all, the, all these projects that I'm t mentioning here are on the, on the um, uh, website here under projects there, and, and then you will find a way to link to it. In fact, next week, uh, we're very proud to present the second um, Society of the Query. Uh, it's kind of a difficult project. I don't know why, but um, it seems we, we were, it was un, uh, impossible for us to uh, find money uh, for this, uh, this event and for this uh, kind of type of research. Uh, everybody is using search engines, but the, 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 the critical research into it is in a very, very early stage. And that is very, very weird in a way. And you would think... If, if everybody is using search engines, you know, everybody would have a kind of uh, alert uh, consciousness uh, about the politics of it. Yeah? Remember at, at, at Google uh, how important it is what the five first uh, hits are. Huh? And you want to know, yeah? you want to know who is deciding uh, because there are humans who are deciding that, right? Uh, Google says, well, it's just machines. Well, that's not, that's of course nonsense because these machines, these algorithms are programmed by people uh, and people have choices and uh, Google has a lot of kind of commercial interests and we know that. But Google also has editorial interests. Google has a lot of uh, influence, in fact, on what we see. So Google is now a main, uh, you know, partner in knowledge production and um, the research about that is really still in a very, very early stage, I have to say. Uh, so what uh, the, the pro the, then the, the second uh, conference that we do um, uh, next w uh, next uh, week uh, really for or f for instance also focuses on uh, the role of search engines in education, uh, at least in the Netherlands, but we know for in many many other countries. Uh, kids from very, very early age, already from, from the moment that they start to read, um, uh, from the age of 8, 9, 10 years old, they start to, to use uh, search engines. 
And uh, we are uh, very, very much in favor that uh, you know, primary schools uh, pay more attention to the politics uh, of search engines uh, because uh, they are treating them as if uh, uh, search engines are ne neutral tools. They are not. And uh, teachers should know more uh, you know, about uh, this. For instance, it's just one of the many uh, topics. Of course, in this program, we are also emphasizing the role of alternative search engines. Huh? In the Netherlands, it's very tragic. Uh, we have a near monopoly of the Google search engine of 95%. It's one of the highest in the world. Huh? So we are really suffering from a, a true monopoly uh, in that particular market. So for us, uh, it's quite acute uh, to emphasize um, the, uh, the existence uh, of uh, alternative search engines. Uh, the next project that we've launched uh, only a couple of year, weeks ago now uh, is called Money Lab. Uh, we don't even have the, the, the kind of design for it. There's no logo or anything for it yet. But M Money Lab is really grown out of uh, the consequences of the global financial crisis in 2008 for the overall e um, internet economy. And what we see is that since 2008, a growing group uh, of people, primarily uh, engineers and uh, entrepreneurs, uh, are uh, becoming aware that uh, the uh, economy of the free that I already spoke about is coming to an end. Now, there is more and more people uh, like here, like you here in the audience, who want to make a serious living out of the internet and who want to break away from uh, the idea that, uh, you know, the, the, that giving away your material is the only option uh, available, right? Uh, we want to move to a situation, we want to live in a world where giving away your material, sharing your material, will become, you know, an, an option, will become and not the default. Uh, and there are now many, many ways uh, uh, to start an in serious internet economy. And we have chosen uh, in this project, uh, Money Lab, to focus on, on three, and maybe uh, in a year or so, uh, we will focus on uh, a few more, because there are a, a growing number of ways to make money on the, on the internet. Uh, of course, the most famous one, and most controversial one at the moment, you see here, is Bitcoin. Uh, that is a, a native, a digitally native internet currency, Cur at the moment still under, um, under um, development. Uh, very in uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, I, I, I can't talk too much here about what's going on uh, with Bitcoins at, at the moment. Uh, but yeah, I'm very excited about it. I, s I s personally believe that at some point you know, Bitcoin will be replaced by something else. Uh, I'm not really sure that all the premises of Bitcoin will make it, uh, uh, but it's, it's very good to see uh, that this evolution uh, has now turned into, uh, you know, a somewhat um, faster uh, process. Uh, Bitcoin is now really uh, in development, it's really working, and people are very seriously uh, trying to uh, make it work. Uh, whether, whether it's going to make it in the end, well, time will tell, uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, please, you know, if you are interested in this, get, get involved because it's very exciting. At the moment, it's still a little bit technical. A lot of it is about uh, algorithms and so on and so on. Uh, so the, so the, uh, the kind of geeky engineering part is still very, very strong, I would say, Somewhere between 70-80% of all the work that's done at the moment is still you know, very, very technical and abstract sometimes. But also deeply political. You know, everything that is discussed there uh, is, um, is, has, has very, very clear political uh, dimensions. And it is a very, very exciting, let's say, collective effort of a growing group of, uh, of people uh, to design uh, this internet uh, currency together. 
You could say, well, the American uh, libertarian, uh, let's say, fraction is very strong. Second to it is a very, very strong left-wing an anarchist uh, German fraction. They are the, the kind of the continental European uh, side of the story, anti-state. Uh, you know, that's, of course, what brings together uh, both positions. But there's also a very, very interesting growing community inside Bitcoin from outside uh, of uh, the US and uh, Europe. And that brings me to the second topic uh, of our network, and that is mobile money. Uh, mobile money, um, especially strong at the moment in Africa, uh, and um, it, it, it's kind of uh, the uh, way to exchange value for the so-called unbankables, for those who do not have a bank account. Um, yeah, it's a very strong, um, let's say, technological uh, given. It works very well already for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it's prob I don't know how well known it is here, here in Turkey, but you know, in general, maybe not. Uh, uh, probably Western banks, uh, credit card companies, I have still have a you know very very high grip on on the Turkish uh, economy. Um, that is not the case in many many other other countries. And there you see the growth of mobile money uh, happening as we speak. The third model we are looking at, and that's uh, where a lot of artists and, and particular filmmakers are uh, already very involved in. That's of course crowdfunding. And crowdfunding uh, it, at the moment, of course, works uh, I with a different um, premise. Huh? With crowdfunding, you don't get your money at the end when you finish your project. Uh, you get the money uh, you, like ordinary funding huh, before, and then you, you realize it, and then probably uh, when it's done, you give it away for free. Uh, well, there's also crowd investing at, at the moment. Uh, so that's a kind of a variation of it. Yeah, so we are also doing research into uh, crowdfunding. And with crowdfunding, we'll, we see that there's a lot of stuff already happening. So a lot of money is already flowing uh, through these channels. But there's very, very little um, research and also very, very cr uh, little critical thinking or debate about uh, it happening. And we really want to uh, kick that off. But uh, tonight, in this presentation, uh, I want to focus uh, on one uh, specific network uh, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, founded uh, on Cyprus, uh, in, let's say, uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, that is called Unlike Us. And the subtitle, uh, I think, explains it all. Uh, Social Media Monopolies and Their Alternatives. Uh, this network... Uh, currently consists of around eight, nine hundred people. Uh, we've uh, had three or four big events, um, and uh, there's also a publication. I've got it uh, with me. And uh, by the way, if you want to have more publications, uh, there's two boxes tomorrow. So if you come to the presentation, uh, they will be uh, around uh, there if you want to take them home. Uh, and the unlike us, a reader. Uh, is one of them. Here you can see some of the topics uh, that we uh, think are important uh, in this uh, particular uh, context. Huh? So um, uh, again, you know, it's kind of the same mix. We uh, emphasize the role of aesthetics and, and um, uh, what we call artistic responses. Uh, we emphasize uh, the technical aspect Probably in this, in this uh, particular context of uh, social media, what we're not doing so much uh, is probably, you know, the whole privacy debate. There's a lot of lawyers and uh, legal organizations that uh, do a fantastic work uh, in this field. We are not a network uh, of lawyers, right? Uh, we are a network of developers in one way or another, activists, artists, programmers, and so on, right? We uh, acknowledge that the legal aspect in this, in this particular case is very important. I think of uh, all the privacy uh, uh, violations. But we also see uh, that the debate is very often limited uh, to the legal level, and that the debate 
uh, is delegated, if you like, to uh, the lawyers or people with a legal background. And we think that's not enough. Because these days, social media is used by so many millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, right? Uh, these topics are political. And uh, we cannot uh, reduce uh, the discussion about social media purely and only to uh, the privacy uh, aspect of it. Okay, so this is the, this is the reader uh, that, I, uh, that I spoke about. It came out uh, earlier, earlier uh, this year. And this reader, for instance, um, I want to connect to the other um, issue from before. Uh, we are, this is the first publication, for instance, that we put out on EPUB. So y you can read it on your smartphone, uh, on, your, on iPad, and so on and so on. So that's, um, for us, that's, that's interesting. Uh, you can, uh, and, and also to see, uh, you know, uh, that research is focused uh, also on this publication. You know, how many people prefer to read it as a PDF? Some, some people like to buy it, in fact. And you can buy it and uh, get it home for free. Uh, no, not for free, but you, you, can, um, uh, you can buy it and, and then get it as a book uh, from print-on-demand uh, services, if you like. Uh, and in that way, there's a, there's a growing amount of different platforms uh, becoming available. And we're very interested in the diversity of these platforms. And this is, for instance, uh, another one. Uh, we developed a, uh, an app for, uh, for iPhone and iPad uh, with uh, that particular material in Dutch to just to see uh, you know, how it would be uh, taken up uh, in, um, in education. Um, and apart from that, uh, we do uh, uh, the, uh, the normal uh, events, just like here, uh, because we still uh, strongly believe that it's very, very uh, you know, worth the effort to bring people together in the physical space uh, for, an, for an event. Uh, so the, the networks, they are, uh, they are really important in that sense. Um, they have to meet uh, in person. And uh, to, m to meet people in person is still worth an incredible <laughs> amount uh, of money, despite all the Skype, the Skype uh, the, uh, and the social media uh, itself, of course. Now, as I said, you know, the whole kind of social media discussion, of course, uh, you know, it is kind of starts starts with this uh, with this simple uh, menu um, and what social media do is that they define they draw they design our social life right our online social life and if for many many more for many many people their online life and offline life is becoming one and the same they're blurring right so the the terms under which we organize our social life uh, is becoming very, very important. And what we see here is, is, is a, in a way, very uh, limited American way of def defining, you know, what is your social life. Uh, in other parts of the world, they would immediately say, where is family, for instance, or, you know, where is my village, or where is... Uh, uh, the people in my village, they're not necessarily my friends, or my family, they're not my friends. Uh, the people I work with, they're not my friends. Huh? Um, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of people have, uh, you know, uh, severe um, yeah, res uh, reservations about this rigid way uh, of uh, organizing, uh, you know, your social life. And in fact, this is a very old uh, website, um, reclaimprivacy.org. This is a very uh, old one. And it kind of goes back to the very, very beginning of, uh, of Facebook. And I don't know if you remember the, the Facebook uh, friend, uh, the, sorry, the, the film uh, that Hollywood made. And already in that film, you can see that uh, there, there was a, a growing tension amongst the founders and the early group of uh, people uh, who started using Facebook. Uh, about this uh, very question. And so, 
the, the question of uh, privacy and privacy violation by Facebook in particular uh, it goes back to the very, very beginning uh, of, this, uh, of this organization. Now, in Europe, uh, in, in fact, in uh, Vienna, uh, there is um, there's this group, Europe uh, versus Facebook, and uh, they're one of the few uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah, influential um, uh, campaigns. They're run uh, by this, uh, this guy that you, uh, that you see here, um, I met him a couple of times, uh, he's, a, he's a, in fact a law uh, student um, and um, yeah, what he, he's doing, he's traveling a lot uh, between Vienna and uh, Dublin. Uh, 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 maybe you don't know, but uh, Facebook Europe is based in, uh, in Ireland for tax uh, reasons and um, uh, all, the, all the, the kind of legal uh, cases against uh, Facebook they will have to go th uh, through the Irish courts before they end up, um, uh, let's say, in the European courts and so on and so on. Uh, of course, uh, he is always also traveling a lot to Brussels, uh, particularly at this very moment, huh, because uh, uh, in Brussels uh, there are a lot of the, uh, the negotiations going on as we speak right now, this week and last week, for instance, uh, about the privacy uh, politics and about the, the different uh, settings that uh, Facebook but also Twitter, uh, Google and so on and so on will be subjected to in, in the near past, uh, in the near future when, uh, when this new legislation will come into place, somewhere next year. So these are very uh, important times uh, in, in that uh, res respect. But our uh, viewpoint is maybe a little bit uh, different. Uh, from the, the Unlike Us network, we are kind of more looking uh, at this phenomena from this perspective. And this perspective, I would say, is more a perspective of uh, you know, how software architectures is uh, producing uh, online social behavior. And this is a question uh, that uh, a lot of the so-called uh, you know, software studies uh, scholars uh, are focusing on. This is not so much a, a per se a, 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 a legal question, but it is a question how software uh, you know, is producing uh, behavior. How uh, and to what extent are we products from these algorithms? And this is uh, a by and large you know, still an unresolved question why? Because, of course, these uh, algorithms, uh, they are not known to us, not to you, not to me. Uh, they are secret. Um, they are a, a so-called uh, black box. Uh, so these, uh, these black boxes, they are defining, in a way, our relationship. Most clear, uh, you, you, you can uh, sense that, for instance, if you go to dating sites. I don't know, ev everybody does. Uh, you know, uh, if you in, if you uh, put in all your data in the dating uh, in, in the dating site, uh, the, the dating site algorithm uh, will uh, then start to compute your case and will uh, will come up with suggestions uh, who you like and who you and also maybe who you don't like. Uh, well, that is the most clear uh, and most obvious. A case in which uh, m you know more, most people are aware like okay it's not me who puts in who I might like no it, uh, it's it's the software uh, architecture that defines who I who I'm uh, I going to uh, like or love or whatever um, of course there's another aspect uh, uh, of the of that that kind of software architecture uh, and this is the m most famous uh, example in the Netherlands, uh, where somebody um, who turned 16 uh, made, the, made the, the, the kind of silly but uh, obvious mistake to invite everybody on Facebook uh, for her birthday party, right? Uh, now, 10,000 of people showed up in that village <laughs> and uh, it caused a riot. By the way, this was not the first time. This was, I think, the third or fourth time it happened. Uh, this was just in the Netherlands and it caused, you know, a lot of damage and people w went uh, into jail. So it, it turned really into a big riot with police, right, with, with riot police. Um, uh, 
uh, so this uh, is very very obvious uh, case where uh, software uh, you know is is defining uh, our uh, our behavior and even you know in that sense um, uh, our uh, social uh, behavior um, a lot of these cases are brought together uh, in in Facebook itself and on Twitter uh, by, by this group, uh, also artist group, and it's, it's called uh, Facebook Resistance. So if you are interested uh, in all this, and if you are on Facebook, um, you can look it up. And this is one of the few places, in fact, inside Facebook itself, where people, uh, you know, talk about these, these types uh, of events, uh, also from let's say not only a legal perspective as I said but also from an artistic uh, perspective um, yeah um, these days of course more and more what we see uh, is that uh, there's a whole kind of uh, well, how can I say it's it, there's a mobilization uh, of, uh, of ethic forces coming up uh, there's more and more people who who want to uh, get involved in uh, you know in defining and restricting your social uh, media consumption. Uh, all done uh, with very uh, good intentions, right? Of course, there is uh, you know there's the censorship. Right? Just think uh, in the in the case of uh, of Turkey, think about you know the YouTube censorship. It's more the most famous. Uh, famous case, uh, of course, uh, there's uh, um, uh, social media censorship uh, across the world, uh, and also in a lot of institutions, in a lot of, uh, by the way, in a lot of companies and so on. You're, you're not you're not allowed to to use it. Uh, so there, there's a lot of um, uh, restrictions, top down. Uh, but what 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 we see, um, especially as a growing trend, uh, is this kind of. Uh, um, yeah, that wants to uh, uh, install inside you some kind of uh, mental, moral uh, authority uh, that w uh, tells you that you have been using social media too much and that you should restrict yourself, right? Well, we can go back to Michel Foucault and read about, uh, you know, the care of the self and uh, how that was done in the old, olden days. Of, um, of self-discipline or disciplining uh, or education of the self eh? but this is clearly uh, a contemporary um, uh, example of that um, the, there's a, another aspect of it uh, which I, I really um, I used to collect a lot of material about these days I've more or less stopped about it that's the whole discussion about the, the lack of uh, um, disagreement. Uh, you remember, you can, in, in Facebook you can only like, you cannot dislike. This is the last very serious attempt by three and a half million people to, to get uh, a dislike button on uh, Facebook. Funny enough, after this campaign, Google, uh, and in particular in Google Plus, decided to install it and in fact, uh, if you now go to uh, something like YouTube, uh, YouTube is making very, very active use uh, of this uh, these days. And it is therefore uh, very strange that M Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook uh, insists uh, up to this day that Facebook will not have uh, you know, a, dislike, uh, a dislike button. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, Facebook, uh, let's say, politics. Uh, case. Um, as I said, um, you know, there's uh, there's more and more uh, kind of public discussion about what you can do and cannot do. Um, yeah, I find the Facebook uh, cheating uh, website also very very interesting. Um, in the, in that uh, respect, there are a few, uh, particularly American uh, websites. These are. Uh, um, websites by the way there a lot of them is kind of very American uh, material huh? Facebook is not American at all huh? if you look at the statistics 
uh, the amount of Americans on Facebook is relatively small. In fact, in, in, in comparison to the 1.2 billion people <laughs> who are already on Facebook right now, um, uh, Americans are only one one sixth or one seventh uh, of the of the entire population. Uh, but uh, y you can find uh, uh, a lot uh, about uh, the um, uh, behavior uh, of uh, of Americans on uh, on Facebook. Um, okay, so there's a whole kind of uh, uh, cultural uh, phenomena. Uh, around that, and which we can, uh, uh, you know, research, discuss, and so on. Uh, but uh, now I, I want to uh, focus a bit more uh, on uh, the, the question of what can you do about it, uh, and that that is maybe also an introduction to uh, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, and uh, in in relation to, you know, what what the social movements. Uh, can, can and cannot do and expect uh, of social media. And uh, especially after NSA and Snowden, of course, we can see that we, there is a strong rise in the public debate ab about uh, personal protection uh, on, on social media. Can we protect ourselves uh, against uh, surveillance and, uh, and uh, th these types of... Um, uh, technological intrusions that are happening here. Well, and I, I believe that there, there's, there, there is, a, you know, there's at least a minimum set that of things that we, we can install to protect uh, ourselves. I, I don't know if we, will, we have to have a, the discussion here about cryptography and about Tor and uh, uh, whether, uh, you know, a crypt cryptography of individual messages um, is a possible solution, but these uh, uh, tools, uh, uh, such as Shabby Not, um, you know, they really help, uh, in my view. Uh, one, one that is even more um, uh, effective, I find, is Ghostry, uh, for instance. And these are uh, very simple to uh, install add-ons on your uh, on your web uh, browser that really make make it harder for commercial companies uh, to follow uh, your, you know, your online uh, behavior. You know, you, you can give them um, somehow a, a bit harder, uh, you know, time. And uh, that's, my, that's my personal uh, t take of it, uh, because it's so easy to uh, install and because it's not really slowing down your, uh, your on online uh, behavior. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we should, uh, for instance, um, at least discuss in uh, education and make young people aware uh, of, uh, of that. Yeah. Um, another uh, thing, for instance, uh, which I find uh, important uh, is, for instance, also this. This tool is very, very interesting. If you are on Facebook, you know, please just use it once at least. Uh, uh, give me by data downloads your entire history uh, of uh, of your Facebook uh, activities and uh, in a way it gives it gives it back to you. Uh, uh, but what Facebook is going to do with it is another matter. But give me my data at least gives you an insight in what uh, at that very moment uh, is stored out there. Of course, there's much much more stored uh, about you. Uh, on the servers of uh, Facebook, but this at least gives you, uh, you know, um, an, uh, an insight. Maybe at that point, uh, you know, you also feel that you've had enough and you want to you wanna, you wanna quit. And in fact, more and more people uh, quit. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say that it's a trend or anything. I don't want to uh, be too optimistic. But, um, yeah, there, there is a considerable amount of people, especially young people, who do not even enter uh, Facebook anymore. And maybe that's uh, because they are bored and they find that uh, the world of Facebook uh, is completely dominated and surveilled by uh, adults. And so the fact that more and more American young uh, people are no longer um, uh, uh, even entering Facebook 
uh, is, uh, in my view, a very positive uh, development. Uh, uh, so that leaves uh, the rest of the world who is out there to, uh, at some point, leave, uh, you know, or just leave it all together. Uh, I can easily imagine that um, Facebook will be um, a ghost web website, a very big one, I agree. Uh, but uh, at some point, people will be bored uh, with it. Uh, and um, that, that boredom is uh, really uh, the biggest uh, hope uh, that, we can, uh, that we can have. Uh, Web 2.0 Suicide Machine is an art project. Uh, it comes from Worm in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Um, uh, of course, it was uh, blocked. Uh, the companies uh, didn't like it. Uh, uh, in fact, now, uh, nowadays, there are a lot of uh, kind of versions uh, of the, the suicide machine. Uh, and the account killer, for instance, uh, is, uh, is, an, uh, is a, um, a good uh, example. Uh, by the way, the, as you can see, the amount of uh, accounts that you can kill uh, is, is quite a lot and is by no means only limited to, uh, let's say, social media uh, as we know it, uh, being Facebook and uh, Twitter. It's much, much, uh, much, much more. And uh, I believe that, especially since uh, the Snowden case uh, with the NSA, uh, more and more people are making, uh, making use of this. Um, and yeah, there, there are um, uh, more and more articles that we find uh, from people who, who say, well, enough is enough, I, uh, I quit and what's happening? Or they write a book about, you know, uh, my life uh, offline. Uh, they went offline for a year, for instance, <laughs> and then write a book about it because it was so exciting. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, yeah, these these are um, uh, all things that are, that are happening. But of course, uh, as I said, you know, there is also a very strong uh, kind of uh, yeah moralistic side to the whole debate, uh, and maybe you know uh, about it. And and that in particular plays out when we when we start talking about the use of uh, uh, by by kids. Uh, young people uh, of social media. Uh, this is a very, very contentious, difficult uh, uh, topic. And um, yeah, the Manfred Spitzer is probably the most uh, w well known uh, German uh, neuroscientist. And uh, there, there are others uh, who have uh, uh, done research in this, uh, uh, in this direction. The one th that I personally like most uh, from all this is uh, Bernard Stiegler from Paris. Yeah, he's a French philosopher. He already wrote this book in 2008. And he has since then uh, gone in this direction. He has also spoken uh, on our uh, events, or in unlike, uh, unlike us. So he's really part uh, of the network and of the debate uh, as, we, uh, as we speak. This is the English translation of his book called Taking Care of Youth and the Generations. And it's a very, very serious um, attempt to look at uh, the, di the dialogue between the, 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 the different generations that uh, he feels is not happening uh, through the social media and uh, is something that, uh, you know, in, inside families and spe especially inside uh, education, should be re-established and uh, he is particularly focusing on uh, you know uh, transmission of ideas through time versus the real-time aspect of uh, of exchanges in uh, in social media um, one of the the, the big uh, you know contentious topics there is of course the whole uh, uh, Valuation of distraction. What do you think of distraction? Uh, people are uh, the, a lot of the research in this field is is focusing on this issue. Uh, is distraction good? Um, uh, what does it mean that people are uh, multitasking? Uh, 
well, if you're on the, on the highways, at least in the Netherlands, you'll see uh, signs everywhere, uh, stop social media, you cannot drive a car and, uh, and do Facebook at the same time. Uh, there's all sorts of public uh, awareness campaigns, maybe also here, happening that you cannot send SMS and drive a car at the same time. Well, that is the, that's the distraction uh, debate, right? And in the US also, uh, there's an uh, enormous amount of uh, statistics uh, gathered about uh, car accidents and people killed uh, uh, because um, uh, people were not uh, um, taking care uh, where, they were, uh, where they were driving. Um, there's also uh, uh, this book uh, by Peter Sloterdijk. Uh, you have to, uh, Du musst dein Leben ändern, uh, that's the German title. You have to change your life is the um, um, English one. I don't know, is it in Turkey? No, no. Uh, it's, it's in uh, French, by the way. Uh, it's, it's been translated in a, in a number of languages. I find this interesting because this book uh, talks a lot about possible solutions for this problem that we have. And it's a very, very interesting the book. is from 2009. Uh, and this was, it's a very serious uh, uh, contribution uh, to this, uh, to this uh, issue, which in my view is, is really one of the biggest issues when we talk about social media. Uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, distraction and uh, how do you deal with uh, multitasking? Um, uh, and how can you, for instance, integrate social media in a productive way in an educational context? Uh, that is going to be a question that is going to be with us for a long time to come. Uh, because the real, the real time media are with us. They are not going to go away. In fact, they're going to be even more real time. And it's going to be more me real time media. And uh, people are going to have more access to real time media. Uh, and uh, so um, the, the question, uh, what, um, what, uh, what uh, Peter Sloterdijk uh, says is, um, how can we, um, can we deal with that, uh, not in a moralistic way? And, but he says, for that, we need to go back to the sports metaphor. He says, we have to train ourselves. And uh, exactly the same in, with sports that training has to be done on a daily basis. So it's not about consciousness or awareness, right? We don't have to feel sorry or guilty about social media. No, we have to train ourselves on a daily basis. And of course, the software can help us with that. Huh? But uh, to, f to find a, a way to cope with the technical media is, is, is going to be something uh, that we need to train ourselves in. And that training, Peter Sloterdijk says, will have to be done on a daily basis. And in, in a way, you're working on your, uh, let's say, techno-social condition, uh, to put it in, in a different uh, way. Robert Faller from uh, Vienna, he, he has uh, come up with another emphasis. Uh, he is also in, in dialogue uh, in this book with Zizek, uh, who is also kind of sometimes playing with this, uh, with this notion of interpassivity. Interpassivity is, uh, is another way of dealing with this issue. It's, a, it's probably almost the same as Sloterdijk says. Well, what interpassivity is about is about the ability to walk away from it. You know, to, just to say, ah, well, who cares? Uh, um, in fact, a lot of the young people uh, find it hard to say, who cares? Uh, who cares about Facebook? Well, uh, they're deeply involved. Uh, they're emotionally involved. Uh, um, they're intimidated very often. Uh, so, um, so to train yourself to say, well, I don't care, is, uh, is quite something. Uh, from California, uh, then, uh, there is not so much uh, uh, contribution to this debate, but there, is, there are books like this. This is ra a rather new one. Uh, again, this also emphasizes the role of training. Uh, as you can see in the title, uh, it's, it's about diet. Uh, and again, um, 
Uh, so that is, uh, uh, but uh, more more interesting and uh, really really interesting. If you are interested in this uh, in this kind of material, is the new book of Howard Rangel. I can highly recommend it. Uh, it's called um, Net Smart: How to Thrive Online. And this book really helps you to um, to limit and to uh, become more aware uh, of what you are doing. Um, it works with, uh, yeah, it's kind of 1970s hippie drawings and, uh, okay, uh, Howard Rheingold is a hippie, uh, you know, but s sometimes, you know, the hippies can uh, cause a lot of troubles, but they can also, <laughs> they can also come up with, with very, very interesting um, solutions for the, for the problems uh, that they have uh, now uh, caused themselves and they can no longer blame their parents, they have uh, caused the, all these problems themselves. And uh, what I find very quite interesting there is that he is using a lot of the techniques of the so-called mindfulness, and that you are becoming aware of what you are doing, that you are breaking down all the steps uh, of this uh, addiction that you uh, that or that we all uh, develop when we are really uh, involved. Uh, in these uh, social media. Uh, the last part of this presentation, I want to focus on the alternatives themselves. And of course, there, uh, the most uh, famous one is Diaspora. Um, unfortunately, one of the founders of a uh, former NYU student, uh, after they all moved to California, he committed suicide. It was a whole drama. Uh, this is a, quite a large site these days. Um, it's got already got a few million uh, users. Uh, it's now given back to the community, so it's kind of it turned itself into an open source project, much like um, uh, you know the Mozilla uh, Foundation. It's a bit similar to that. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the diaspora, uh, m maybe that chapter is uh, is now uh, 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 closed, but. It's interesting because um, uh, you know all these uh, uh, alternatives that I'm showing here. Uh, they work with different notions. Uh, a very, very. And the key difference uh, to uh, Facebook and Twitter is that they emphasize that the internet uh, is a distributed and decentralized network, and this is precisely what Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and so on huh, are uh, going against. Uh, because they are uh, centralizing all these services, um, uh, and they want to they, they, uh, through cloud computing, through their uh, network of data centers, they are concentrating uh, the the um, uh, the power of the internet and uh, in very few hands. Uh, what these uh, this did, what these uh, um, initiatives all say. Now we should go back to the drawing board. We should go back to the basics. Uh, internet is a network of networks. It's it's a distributed network. And what does that mean? And what does that mean for social media these days? Uh, that we have to go back uh, to decentralized uh, networks. Pump IO is a very interesting. It's more like a GitHub type of place where where code. Uh, comes together, code from different uh, initiatives and different already different generations. Uh, it's slightly more technical. Um, StatusNet I find interesting because it, it wants to be uh, a decentralized network for Twitter. Uh, so that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, how can we? And that's for activists, of course, uh, quite uh, quite important uh, to uh, to think about. Libertri there's Liberty, uh, Friendica is kind of a bit more German, Central European maybe. Uh, here it says uh, the slogan is quite interesting, the internet is our social network. Uh, so it's not Facebook who is our social network, uh, it's the internet itself. And um, Crabgrass is another one. Uh, a lot of these initiatives emphasize not so much, uh, let's say, the, the counter uh, grassroots part of it. They emphasize 
that the solution for th these social monopolies is lying uh, in the development of different protocols and standards themselves. Uh, so they say social media uh, is, a, is, is a question of protocols. It's not a question of one website where everybody is going. No, we should completely uh, take that apart and say, if I want to connect to you, or if you want to follow me, or if you, I want to be your friend, uh, we can resolve that uh, in terms of a technical protocol. And that should not be resolved on the level of one centralized server. Right? That is uh, the philosophy. Uh, here there are, a f uh, I show you a few uh, you know, examples of, of uh, people who have started to implement these uh, ideas. The most uh, famous one in Europe, uh, in, in the activist circle, is this Loria. It comes from, uh, from the Spanish activists, from the Indignados uh, movement uh, from 2011. Interesting uh, that they have, at, thi at this moment, they have already completely moved on. They want to turn uh, Loria into uh, a real-time peer-to-peer Skype network. They want to they wanna, uh, revolutionize the telephony in itself. And just think about you know, what happened when Skype was bought by Microsoft. That was a very, very, very important moment. And because with that, a whole development was cut off. And Skype was integrated into centralized structures. Remember Skype eh, is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized protocol. Eh? Skype didn't used to have a lot of uh, servers or infrastructures. No, you were just talking directly to the other person, right? Nowadays, there is the uh, centralized Microsoft network. Eh? Um, and uh, so the, 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 the comrades of Loria, they say, well, we have to kind of continue uh, in that direction. Yeah? So a lot of the philosophy uh, of these groups um, is, uh, is based on um, uh, these peer-to-peer -peer networks. Here, uh, I've, this is kind of a lot of text, but um, what, what is important here is this sentence Loria aims to become a network of federated networks and that is uh, in itself is a new uh, idea it's a new concept developed over the last one or two years and we will see uh, a lot of uh, developments over the next years uh, in that direction yeah? and I want to close here with this uh, with this notion um, you know what is Federation. Uh, you remember the, uh, the United States of, of America is a federation. Uh, the Republic of uh, the Dutch Republic in the 17th century was a federation. Uh, what, what, what is what is a federation? Uh, um, and what is the philosophy uh, of federating? What does it mean when nodes, larger nodes of people, come together? and create a, a federation. This is kind of an idea that uh, a lot of the uh, kind of geek activists think that a possible solution for the Facebook drama and the social media monopolies is lying in this moment, in this act of federation. Okay? Um, and there are uh, a lot of people um, uh, who who wanna who wanna contribute to that? Because what they say is that the solution for the Facebook problem is not only lying in horizontal communication. In a way, they are also criticizing the uh, the idea of decentralization per se. They say the solution for Facebook is not the complete fragmentation of the internet. Is not complete decentralization. No, we still in this, in this world, also as activists, we want to scale up. We want to think, uh, if necessary, in horizontal ways, not only in, uh, in, in, in verticals or in horizontal ways. 
and yeah, there are there's many many people who who work in in that uh, in that direction. Uh, here I want to show also a few uh, which I find interesting because, uh, for instance, AppNet. What I'm showing here is interesting because it's a commercial activity. M many many people think that you know only uh, kind of activists are working in this direction. Uh, that is uh, not uh, not true. T there's tent, for instance, with uh, uh, and here you can see uh, the terms. The terms are, uh, in a way, even more important than the code that these people are uh, uh, putting out. Uh, distributed social networking protocol. Uh, th this is kind of, uh, that's uh, the message uh, of the, the next uh, generation. And funny enough, uh, Ward Cunningham, the, the, the inventor of the wiki, uh, is working uh, in the same uh, direction and he is working uh, these days on what he himself is calling a federated wiki and this is uh, what that means is that you know my information allows to connect with your information this is this is the philosophy and that is the act of federation yeah uh, and, and this is precisely uh, what Facebook and so on is not doing, and uh, what the centralized information structures is uh, not doing. And uh, to wrap up here, I want to say uh, is that this is a very old image from 1981, produced by the Rand Corporation at the very beginning of the whole network story of the internet uh, when it was first developed. That we are now kind of working towards option number D, not yet here, huh? federation. How would federation look like? Huh? Try to, in your head, try to think of how it could look like. Uh, and that's uh, probably you know, where uh, all these uh, social media activists um, are um, at. Um, me, uh, I'm only contributing uh, you know, in a very limited way. This is my personal contribution to the debate and I want to talk about that tomorrow. And my contribution to that specific debate uh, is lying in the organized networks. But more about that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, you emphasized on uh, uh, the distributed, the mm -hmm. importance of distributed yep. networks. Mm -hmm. But do you think that it's enough to have distributed networks, or, uh, for example, what do you think of like Freedom Box project, like peer-to-peer mm -hmm. -peer distributed uh, networks? Would that make a difference? For example, you are keeping your own that data in, at your home, like yeah. a cloud computer mm -hmm. that you can run and you mm -hmm. can choose and so that there is no other mediation like those companies who you know, give that distributed yeah. services uh, for you, or is this enough that it's well, distributed? Well, yeah. One more thing. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is something yeah. I really don't know. And uh, it, it, uh, do you use uh, the terms uh, social media and social networks Mm. interchangeably or do you think that there's a difference or do you think uh, there's a miss or it, what's the issue with that? Okay, well to, to, to start with the last one uh, first, uh, social networks and social networking uh, are in fact uh, terms from uh, the sociology of the late 1970s and social network analysis uh, from that time tried to map uh, the behavior uh, of, uh, of people in groups and uh, try to uh, already at that time try to visualize uh, these uh, relationships in diagrams uh, and the social networking uh, very often especially in the early 90s was coming from from that from that particular school and uh, remember that one of the most uh, important terms of social media and uh, particularly Facebook um, is the is the exploitation of the so-called weak link and the weak link is for instance is a term that comes from uh, social network uh, analysis uh, from a guy called Granowetter 
uh, who developed uh, that term. Uh, if I started the, the presentation with the, uh, with the whole uh, philosophy uh, of Facebook of uh, friends. Uh, and uh, being a friend of a friend of a friend is precisely uh, that weak link. Uh, and this is kind of how uh, these social networks can grow so fast. Uh, because uh, Facebook uh, has aimed uh, to, uh, to further explore the weak links of, of your network uh, so that they can grow faster. Uh, and they're in a, in a way st still doing that. So yes, social networking uh, is is a is a very specific kind of scientific uh, discourse and scientific method, if you like. That these days in 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 uh, in, a, in the era of uh, of computer networking huh, can be utilized in very specific uh, ways. And the, the tragedy, you could say, of social networking is precisely lying in this, uh, uh, in this centralization, this maybe, uh, you know, unexpected centralization that is happening. Because a lot of people did not expect this uh, to happen, that uh, the Internet would be centralized in such a fast way almost within a decade, uh, all the uh, decentralized distributed networks have been wiped out and we are left uh, with very few, very centralized, mega important uh, yeah, media monopolies. Um, do I use social media and social networking synonymous? Um, no, I don't think so. I think there is still social networking possible outside these very limited uh, amounts of uh, social media companies. So, yeah, but maybe it's time to reassess the social media, <laughs> the social uh, networking uh, parameters, you know, that we use. For instance, in this case, in my proposal of organized networks, I say that we have to go move away from the weak links and that social movements for instance would benefit a lot if we would see uh, networking uh, part of, uh, of an effort to grow strong links strong links between people and uh, I understand that there is a potential in social media to grow very fast uh, and that's precisely what we see in the social movements today. And that we can grow from a from very, very small amount of people who are concerned with the uh, ecological impact of Getty Park to, you know, suddenly thousands, tens of thousands of people who are involved in a matter of, what, a few days, a few weeks, yeah? So that we have an enormous potential to grow very fast. Uh, but there's also a dark side of that. Namely, that we disappear in the same hmm? in the same speed. Uh, so, um, yeah. And uh, the first uh, question you asked that was about uh, is be distributed uh, enough or yeah. be peer to peer distributed, like the freedom yeah, bus yeah, yeah. model. Because one is yeah. like that we are also sure. subject to yeah. the, uh, those networks are otherwise we are uh, the peers and we are not subject to any node no. that's uh, distributed in, in yeah. this distribution. Yeah, well, uh, I think that that discussion is uh, at the moment is quite esoteric and quite technical and is, is being dealt with by a very small group of people. And, but what I want to do with these presentations with Unlike Us Network is that we share this experience of small, of small groups with more people. Because you, the question that you ask is rather technical and is unresolved. Huh? And I would like to <laughs> kind of democratize and share that, those experiences because I think they are so vital, they're so important. 
And uh, I would love that they are translated, for instance, by artists, by cultural producers, communicators, yeah? So that the question of how should this network society look like, you know, under which uh, conditions are we communicating together, which is so important for all the everyday life uh, uh, of ordinary people, uh, is shared uh, in, in a larger uh, context. Uh, because, uh, uh, for instance, um, at the moment, what we see, for instance, if we look at uh, the, the more important discussion that is related to what you ask, namely the question of Tor, and uh, should we use uh, cryptography or not, and should the, the, the cryptography that we use the, that make us more safe and protect us against secret services, uh, and NSA, and so on, uh, sh and, uh, uh, how should that, uh, that crypt cryptography uh, network, how should, under which uh, circumstances should that work? And at the moment what we see is that most people say, well, it's the, the technical problems are still so large that, that there's only a very small group of activists <laughs> who understand something about it. And even they have difficulties, uh, you know, to claim even for themselves that they are fully safe when they communicate with someone else, right? So, so that, there are so many unresolved issues, but we cannot run away from them. We cannot say, oh, well, you know, leave it up to a few people and they will sort it out. Leave it up to Jakob Oppelbaum and, and all the rest and they will sort it out for us. I don't believe uh, that. You know, this should be part of the public debate. Why? Because it is about the, the communication infrastructure of the billions in the end. And we cannot say, ah, oh, well, that's only a concern for a small group of people. At the moment, yes. In the near future, no. Okay, yeah. It thinks to, I mean, as an example, I'm sure they, if they act like this to uh, against Kurdish people, I'm sure they have similar uh, reactions to other nations. But they basically bank their personal and political parties' pages. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. how we, uh, as a user or as, as a member of, of this uh, website, how we uh, I mean, is there any international law to uh, to stop them doing that, or to, to be more uh, democratic, or equally behave in, in mm -hmm. every nation? Well, the the problem country? is they are uh, completely uh, entitled to do that because they are just a, a media company and they can do whatever they like, and uh, and uh, this if this is their their uh, you know choice. There's no uh, no judge in the world that is going to say you know these or that people, this party or that movement, this person or that dissident, you know should be on Facebook and you should allow these people to make use of your services. You know that that's why uh, you know I'm um, here um, uh, in favor uh, of a complete different makeup makeover of internet. Uh, and emphasize the importance of standards and protocols because on that level you cannot do things like that. You cannot, yeah? That, the, 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 that type of, of censorship doesn't work on the level of standards and protocols. So, yep. Uh, I want to actually uh, comment on the previous question first mm -hmm. and go on. Uh, I think there's one uh, issue with this is that uh, by law, uh, the, the data belongs to the Facebook. That's why there's mm -hmm. a problem here, right? They cannot, ex I think, easily um, take away or up download their contact 
exist or social network, those pages who are censored, right? If they could do this, it would change this dynamic probably. So by default, Facebook thinks that they own this data, so they can actually block yeah. this website. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even, you know, they just block that. All the followers of the, these parties, then they become basically blank pages or something, as a result of this law. Uh, this is, I think, a commerce law or something, I don't know what law is it, but there's a problem of, uh, that raises, right, comes from the United States in general. Um, I want to ask questions, of, thanks for the presentations, by the way, it's beautiful. Um, I want to ask a question on um, the, op the alternatives of these social media products, mm -hmm. or platforms, let's say. Um, uh, you showed many examples, great ones, actually. Um, and I thought uh, there's one, there are one or two issues here. Like one is, and there is a general uh, problem, I think. One is the, uh, the problem of these uh, open source software tools becoming the same of the central one <laughs> or the paid one, you know? In the past, you had this, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, this is a dilemma in a way, that we know about as well, but in the past, we had, uh, we had these uh, office software, for instance. It's the uh, tragedy of the open source. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I want to just <laughs> yeah. uh, hear what you think about it. In general, there's one question here. Uh, so that means that we don't have alternative or uh, kind of experimental, let's say, uh, social software platform mm. or something. And yeah. Why is this, and what must, what, what causes these mm -hmm. things? For instance, this is one thing. Um, and mm. lastly, um, I think I was going to ask a question on. Let me see. Wait a second. Maybe mm -hmm. answer this first, and then. I'll yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, for that, I, I have to go back to the the. the the, the, the general questions that uh, the philosopher of speed, uh, Paul Virilio, uh, always emphasizes. You know, he, I'm very influenced by what he is writing. And he is posing a lot of kind of general questions uh, that are related to this. One is, is the, 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 the most... Uh, you know, general one that he is always referring to is uh, is we look at an object, we look away, we look back, and the object has changed, right? And th this this kind of this this problem uh, uh, is is fundamental uh, to um, internet activism, and that 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 the, the problem there is we look at a f at an object, let's say social media, we look away, and we start to develop. A, a uh, alternatives and then we come back to it and the moment we come back to it the field itself has already changed and this is one of the one of the big problems uh, that uh, we see uh, how can how can what how can we uh, respond uh, you know almost in real time when things are going so fast when uh, behavior of billions of users are, is changing uh, so fast uh, do we have time to develop, for instance, alternatives? Uh, is there time uh, for that? Uh, I've always asked myself, you know, is there still time, for instance, to develop a free software uh, alternative for Android, for instance? You know, uh, Android, of course, itself claims that it's open source. Well, it is not. Uh, it's owned by, uh, owned and controlled by, uh, by Google. Uh, and in that sense, um, you know, at the moment, most of the mobile phone users in the world, really, uh, I think up somewhere between uh, two and three billion people are using uh, Android. Huh? Do, we, do we have the time, do we have the possibilities huh, to, for instance, develop a full-fledged alternative? I think intellectually, you know, just in terms of our capabilities, in, in terms of our collective imagination, I think, yes, uh, we can. Do we have time for that? Yeah? No. And this is, and this is the problem. Yeah? Because if we would move away, if we would uh, then, and then uh, develop it and come back, yeah? the field <laughs> has already changed. And we know that, for instance, from, from the browser wars, in which I, I myself was in deeply involved in the 1990s. Yeah? Uh, and out of the browser wars developed, uh, you know, the Firefox and, and so on and so on. Yeah? I mean, how important is, uh, is the browser war at the moment for us? I'd say almost not. Huh? Yeah, but 
still the, this, the, there's a considerable amount of, uh, of programmers and uh, people who care about alternatives who are still working with that on that issue, that issue which was already raised around 95, 96, right? And we're now, what, um, uh, 16 years later, <laughs> no, more, 17, 17 years later, right? Uh, so, yeah, th that is one of the, one of the main uh, uh, kind of uh, issues that, that, I, that I see that um, we some, for instance, and that is one of the most, big, the biggest dangers uh, that I face with these uh, social media alternatives that I showed, right? Because we know, we already know that in a few years from now, people will probably s not spend so much time on, on social media as they do now. There will be something else. And why not? For me, it's different. Uh, yeah. uh, at least what you think, it's the UI example is quite right in one hand. Um, I, I guess you also talk about mm -hmm. kind of the, the alternatives, the economics of the alternatives, let's say, right? Mm. Like that's what yeah, you precisely. Were, were all important about that yes. at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's one other option of that I see a lack, at least, you know, that, uh, for instance, rather than producing the alternative, producing a counter and then kind of try to scale on that counter, maybe. Mm -hmm. And yet, another option. Because alternative is almost like a parallel, you know, like a, yeah. you know, a parallel. creative at times usually you know the pro is that example maybe you know uh, yeah. you know some of the uh, things that are produced in, in the technical world mm -hmm. some of the bits in here and there are kind of creative enough that they can maybe scale it can be an interesting yeah. strategy I don't know, in general um, and on that note I think also what's important here is that uh, you mentioned the, the Mozilla Foundation for instance mm -hmm. and also the other uh, let's say the open source development in general, uh, if you look at the product level of the, so the software tools at the interface level, they are most, they look like copies or free copies or decentralized <coughs> copies of the central ones and stuff. But if you look at the, uh, let's say, in the more small products, not like uh, mm. end user products, but more like libraries, program <coughs> libraries and stuff, yeah. they are kind of creative, I can say. Yeah. And then th there's a maybe a potential to, again, to scale from that level. Uh, these plural ideas. Well, so they're very important questions that uh, you uh, you raise. But still, I I I, th I also find you know that for, from a utopian perspective, we can just uh, turn all these large efforts because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are involved in each of those projects, right? That I showed, they're not necessarily not not necessarily small. If you think of Loria, for instance, and the, the role it's playing in uh, in Spain, uh, it's it's considerable. You know, there's 200,000 people who are use, making use of it on a daily basis. Uh, these 200,000 people they are in contact with each each other. Uh, you know, uh, very in a very intense and autonomous uh, way. Uh, they have now made the next step. They are they have turned themselves, for instance, into a political party at the moment. So I don't know. Uh, what do you think of this step? You know, well, we can discuss that. But uh, within the Spanish context, for instance, that is a very important uh, next step that they uh, want uh, to uh, that they want to make together. And uh, that political party is based, for instance, on the networks, uh, the Loria type networks that are there. I don't know. You, you, whatever you you think of the of the pirate party in Germany, for instance, and uh, and what they do, huh? but I find the way, the way they they have uh, thought about uh, liquid democracy as a as a tool to uh, to experiment with other types of uh, democratic decision making within their party. I personally find that interesting, and I know it's a failure. And I know there's a lot of problems to it, but I want to know those problems. I want to know, you know, people who are seriously trying something else, what their experiences are. And um, yeah, that's what we try to do with Unlike Us. That's our, uh, you know, modest contribution to that 
much larger dialogue. Thank you.